Hey guys, it's Michael from 90 Plus Scamsat with a quote interpretation to the STEM technology and AI. I actually just recorded this, but accidentally deleted it. So here we are again. All right, let's start with prompt one. Big tech is bad, big AI will be worse. So I'm always looking uh, to understand where the person's coming from with a sense of respect for them. So I assume that they know something that I don't and that uh, looking underneath this prompt, um, there will be something or that it will gesture towards some kind of social issue that Acer is inviting me or prompting me to respond to. So big tech is bad. Uh, let's wonder why. Why is big tech bad? The first few things that come to mind is surveillance capitalism, so companies profiting off our digital exhaust um, uh, and commodifying uh, our online experience, and as we increasingly situate ourselves in our online world, uh, commodifying us, and continuing to furnish us into the kinds of political subjects and moral bodies that can thrive within capitalism, because that's not natural for us. We need to be remade and fashioned into the kinds of people that can uh, value as vice as things that were um, uh, or value as virtues, things that were vices for all of human history, like lack of self-control. In other words, we've got Louis Vuitton instilling in us the desire for a bag and then commodifying our, our activity to go and get it. So that's one thing, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> another thing uh, that comes to mind is perhaps that big tech companies for the first time in human history have more power than governments to influence human behavior, whether it's Pokemon Go driving customers to a pizza shop because Mewtwo's in it, or whether it's uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica influencing the Brexit uh, and Donald Trump elections, which have major uh, geopolitical repercussions. Uh, also, that the tech companies are divested of moral and legal culpability um, for uh, that influence. Um, and then perhaps another one, if you haven't seen The uh, the Social Dilemma, it's a documentary on Netflix, it's a good one, um, just the idea of echo chambers. So basically that uh, uh, we tend to give more attention and time to views that mirror our own. And so... Um, uh, social media companies will uh, repeat views to us that are our own. And so we tend not to, in our online worlds, come into confrontation with the complete conflicting idea. And so when we meet someone in the real who has that idea, we think, how could you be so stupid? And that makes debate increasingly incommensurable and silos political, uh, political opinion. So I think that's enough on that. Uh, as far as big AI will be worse, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, perhaps... Uh, 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 integrity with study and universities. I don't want to go there though, because I think a lot of people are going to go there. And when we zig, others, or when others zig, we want to zag. Um, the truth is, at, at this point in the STEM, it doesn't, nothing fires for me immediately about why big, big AI will be worse. And I haven't really got time when I'm quote interpreting to sit and just like, oh, I wonder what, I wonder what. So at this point, I would actually just move on and see if something later on clicks for me. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let's go to prompt two. When distribution of information is left in the hands of a few, the result is political and economic oppression. Okay, so this is gesturing to me straight up to um, uh, the press and or the free press and the media, which had its origins in uh, the French Revolution. Uh, and this was an important time. You've got to think the printing press was almost like the Instagram of the day. Um, prior to that, <clears throat> books had to be handwritten and, and that that process cost money and it was controlled by, uh, very strongly controlled by the powers that be. With the printing press, you had kind of the mass uh, ability to, to, to disseminate information. And so that really decentralized information. And it was a, a big revolution at the time. It was kind of like the invention of the internet uh, for them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, also too, it held uh, leaders, kings and such accountable in a way that they hadn't been before, because, you know, maybe before that I was upset, but I didn't know that the bloke down the road was as well. But when we've got things like now newspapers, it kind of centralizes political opinion and holds the leaders accountable uh, in ways that they weren't before. And that perhaps led in part to the, to the fall of feudalism. Um, <clears throat> and the rise of the nation state within modernity. Uh, okay, so in the hands of a few, I think it's, it, uh, when I say the hands of a few, that bit stands out to me. I think it's impossible to have for a human, it's a typically human feature to be um, biased and, and to be pol political. Uh, and so it, it's almost necessary that if something's in the, in the hands of a few, we're going to see, for example, the Murdoch Empire, we're going to see their political and economic intentions kind of... Um, uh, uh, ricocheting through uh, uh, those publications, as it were. Uh, and so perhaps this person's suggesting that there ought to be um, a greater decentralization of power in the media. Um, although, you know, it's not always a bad thing. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln. Um, one of the early leaders had, uh, it was called the Gazette, uh, and and uh, that was... Uh, uh, not used for the intention of swaying the political opinion per se, but uh, but was a legitimately informative um, publication. Um, okay, so I think this this is really just getting at perhaps an opportunity to talk about the history of the free press and and its um, and its uh, how it operates as a feature. 
uh, within modernity and politics. Uh, all right. Three, to prevent data monopolies from ruining our lives, we need to mobilize effective countervailing power and fast. So the first thing that stands out to me is that the mobilize effective countervailing power and fast. For a few reasons. One, it's particularly military. Uh, so uh, I always just, you know, whenever, whenever I see uh, the use of, of strange parts or, or metaf metaphor, I always uh, assume it's for a very good reason. Uh, and then effective versus ineffective. I guess what would be ineffective countervailing power? I think it's perhaps suggesting that the that whatever uh, forces that we've tried to um, uh, use uh, have not in fact been effective. Uh, and so the, the question remains: In what sense are dumb data monopolies ruining our lives? Again, nothing's coming immediately to mind, so I would move on from this prompt. Uh, four, rather than machine intelligence, what we need is machine usefulness. Okay, so I think this one is really getting at that we need to subordinate uh, machines to human will, not try and invest machines with a will of their own. Uh, and perhaps this also goes to the ruining of the lives. But, you know, we've seen the popularization in movies such as The Terminator or iRobot, um, how AI may uh, uh, lead to um, human destruction. Uh and, and perhaps also this is inviting a discussion of what, uh, which reminds me, I actually wonder if I can pull it up, uh, a, a discussion of what is it that makes uh, humans typically human? Uh, and what is it that, that makes uh, machines incommensurable with the faculties that make us particularly human? Um, for Aristotle, we are the rational animal. Um, but for Oscar Wilde, we are anything but rational. Let me see if I can, uh, bear with me two moments first. I'm just going to pull up some notes from last sitting that I took. Here it is. I'll just read this to you. In Edward Fez's 2019 novel, Aristotle's Revenge, he describes the third kind of life as the rational kind, which is the distinctively human form of life. Our understanding is what distinguishes us, distinguishes us from both beast and computer. It is the condition that transcends the vegetative, computative, and animal capacities of other thinking things by adding the ability to abstract concepts and abductively reason. So abduct means uh, to make a best guess. It's a typically human quality. For Oscar Wilde, from the picture of Dorian Gray, 1891, however, this is the most premature definition ever given. Man is many things, but he is not rational. Perhaps which distinguishes us, for me, is that it is to feel that makes us so very human. Recall the poem given at the end of the Book of Mice and Men, Steinbeck, 1937, in which the jail protagonist envies the mice scuttering by who thinks only of the next meal. Perhaps it is our pathos, not our logos, to use the language of Aristotle once more. To be unfeeling is to be traumatised, from the Greek, literally wounded. Human flourishing as human beings individually and socially is frustrated by unfeeling people. Indeed, debate persists in and even defines human rationality. We feel and tell we are homo narrans, the storytelling creature. So that was a paragraph I wrote uh, from an accumulation of, of various points. So I think all those uh, are relevant and, and we could use them to great effect in this particular um, stem. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think uh, four is getting getting it basically uh, how uh, there are faculties of humans that make us particularly human and that, that are incompatible with machines, and, and that for those reasons, uh, machines ought to be subordinate to human will, not made to try and uh, emulate human will. All right, I hope that gives you some ideas where you might like to go. If what went through your mind is that's all great, Michael, but how am I supposed to know that? Uh, it's not that I'm smart. That might have sounded real smart, but where that paragraph came from, literally not one word in that paragraph I wrote. My, actually, that's a lie. There was a couple of filler words that I like. But almost all those points are an accumulation of various things that I've read, heard in courses. When you're out there in the field exposing yourself to people that are very intelligent, use the 90 plus resources. I've tried to get like, you know, Nashad and Shabir and myself to, to say these things to you. Write them down, copy them, listen to the minefield, read opinion pieces. Um, uh, I, in the Discord, there's a, um, under the ideas channel, uh, there's a link to various blogs that you might use. When you're exposing yourself to better sources of, uh, of information and writing them down, you can kind of combine them in, it's almost like, I don't know how the whole puzzle fits, but I can see that this piece and this piece belong together. And, you, and when you start accumulating all these little great insights and that, you start to see how they come together and, and they, and they turn into bigger paragraphs. And then in the end, you can express yourself entirely in terms of them. All right. I hope that helps. Thanks, guys.